I am very happy to be joined by Brian Beecher, who will be talking about his overall preservation strategy at ICPSR, and we'll be also looking at how he has implemented DuraCloud as part of that strategy. But to, to begin the presentation, uh, first I'll just briefly tell you about DuraSpace. DuraSpace is the not-for-profit organization, which really uh, provides guidance and support to two pretty well-known open source technologies, DSpace and Fedora, which are used by over 1,200 institutions for managing and preserving and providing access to their digital content. We are committed to provide open source technologies and services that promote durable, persistent access to what we call the scholarly record, and that is content that our academic institutions and cultural heritage institutions are responsible for stewarding. When we began to look at some of the challenges our community was facing in terms of providing persistent access and preserving the content, we began to think about how can we help address some of those challenges with new and upcoming technologies which would go beyond our preservation platforms, be it DSpace and Fedora. And some of the, the key challenges our folks, our communities were having, were telling us they were having was the ability to readily provision online accessible storage, ideally in different geographies, ideally off their campus, campuses run by other administrations. And this is mm -hmm. one of the fundamental premises of, of a preservation strategy is multiple copies of content in different geographies and ideally under different administrations so you have different technical architectures that are supporting that part of the strategy. So that's kind of the, the first step. Second step is to be able to synchronize that content across those different architectures and storage systems. And, uh, and sometimes that's very difficult to do because there's no common pathway to be able to synchronize across idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic systems. Next, to be able to do health checking of the content to make sure that there's been no bit rot or that the content hasn't corrupted over time um, and to be able to do that across multiple systems can be challenging. And of course, for deploying any anything at this scale requires technical resources. Of course, a preservation policy needs to be in place and a sustainability strategy for over time. So we thought there might be an opportunity using emerging cloud technology to at least address some of the technical challenges associated with putting in place a preservation strategy. And why we felt the cloud was attractive was because with very, you could deploy storage and compute without owning the infrastructure. You could do it over the web. It was available as a service. Um, it was easily scalable and dynamic. Uh, so it didn't require a big investment in capital or upfront provisioning. And we felt that this could be attractive to our community to be able to deploy one piece of a preservation strategy using cloud technology. We went out to our community, um, we did a survey and out of that, uh, and on that survey we asked, mm -hmm. would they consider cloud services uh, for things like preservation support? Um, or potentially shared infrastructure. And out of the 211 responses, you can see from the survey that although many of our institutions would not consider cloud storage as a primary store for their digital content, they were interested in looking at it for online backup digital content, for preservation support, and also for shared infrastructure. Also interesting to note, um, this was a, a very recent study that came out by ESG, and this is looking at the total worldwide digital archiving capacity by media type, just to look at what the trends are in a much broader industry outside of academia. So cloud right now makes up about 3% of uh, digital media type for digital archiving, um, but with growing as projected to 12%. So it's becoming a, a larger share of what media type is used by digital archiving. And this is by the broader um, industrial sector, uh, which does include academia. 
So what is DuraCloud? DuraCloud is a platform and an open source technology uh, that we provide, DuraSpace provides as a managed service. It runs on cloud infrastructure and it runs across multiple cloud providers. So it enables an institution to upload content and make copies of that content to multiple cloud providers all through one unified dashboard. Uh, right now, DuraCloud is hooked up um, to Amazon and Rackspace. On the roadmap are Microsoft Azure and most recently San Diego Supercomputer, which will be our first academic cloud, and we're very excited about that. Um, you can put content in any of these cloud providers. You can move content across cloud providers as you wish. You can synchronize the content across those cloud providers, and you do it through one common interface, one application, and that's DuraCloud. Also enabled in DuraCloud are several applications. The ones I have here are the ones that were developed specifically for uh, implementing archiving and preservation support um, on the DuraCloud platform. So as mentioned, you can back up your content to these multiple cloud providers. When your content is being ingested, it will check the file format and tell you if it is not correct. Um, also on the roadmap is file validation tools so that it will actually come back with um, what we believe the file is. Uh, you can do health checking across the multiple cloud providers. So it will check the bit integrity and then compare it to potentially your local copy or a manifest and off of manifest that you have in place. And lastly, you can synchronize your content across the multiple cloud providers. So as content changes or is added, it will keep two or more clouds in sync. So in summary, some of the archiving and preservation support that DuraCloud um, offers today is easy backup um, online to the multiple cloud providers. It keeps those backups in sync. It checks the health of the backups. You can view and download the files, and that's all through the web-based dashboard or using um, other uh, programmatic interfaces. You can retrieve and restore files from DuraCloud if something happens to your local copy, and that's available also through web-based interface or through programmatic interfaces. And everything is web accessible, so you can view it anytime, anywhere, as long as you have an internet-connected device. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Brian Beecher. And I'm going to make you the presenter here, Brian, in just a sec. Thanks, Michelle. And uh, I just want to make sure, uh, can folks hear me OK? I'm going to look at to see if DuraSpace says yes. Yes. Yes, Brian, we can hear okay. you. OK. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Brian Beecher. And I'm essentially the uh, IT director at a place called ICPSR. Um, my team manages all of the, the technology, software development, desktop computing, uh, servers, clouds, uh, all the tech for, for ICPSR. And uh, so the story I'll tell today will be uh, how we started using uh, DuraCloud as part of our archival storage uh, strategy. Uh, but to tell that story, I need to tell you a little bit about ICPSR, uh, how we had been doing things until recently, uh, what we did next, and then what led us to uh, DuraCloud. So ICPSR is an acronym for Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research. It really rolls off the tongue. Uh, we're located at the University of Michigan, and we, uh, we're the world's largest archive of social science research data. We have a, a lot of uh, survey data and a lot of government data. Uh, we're in operation now for 50 years, and we've got a lot of uh, fine 50th anniversary uh, events going on this year. And we're about a $15 million a year not-for-profit company uh, in a lot of ways. So uh, our archival holdings tend to be lots and lots and lots of little files, about 2 million little files, about six terabytes total, so in some ways, it's not nearly as big as collections of, uh, you know, images of space or uh, information collected by, uh, by sensors. Uh, certainly back in the day when I worked in the telecom business, even the monthly call records um, that we would collect with, you know, 
what number called which number and when uh, accumulated uh, data far more quickly uh, than our, our social science archive. Uh, the type of files we tend to have uh, that we put in archival holdings uh, tend to be plain text because uh, it's really just numbers and uh, maybe some PDF or XML documentation so that people can interpret these uh, files of just numbers. Uh, typically things come in the door as one of the stat packages and maybe some technical documentation in a, in a word processor format. And so our strategy for preserving content is for something that uh, comes in as an original, we might just do bit level preservation. Uh, so maybe something comes in and say SPSS, uh, the stat package for the, uh, the data, and maybe a researcher has uh, written up the documentation in Word or WordPerfect or something like that. And then we like to normalize our content whenever possible into, some, into a more durable format. Uh, typically, that's plain text for the data, uh, an XML for the metadata, uh, potentially PDFA where possible uh, for, the, for the documentation. And then we also have transformations in the common stat formats and in PDF for download. Uh, that, so the point here is that there's a real distinction between the formats that we preserve and the formats that we tend to deliver to our community. Uh, they tend to be, other than maybe the PDF uh, documentation, uh, they tend to be disjoint um, uh, sets. Uh, and we've always kept multiple copies of our content, and now we're keeping uh, more than in the past. So I wanna take you back uh, a little ways in history, all the way back to 1 BC, uh, that's before cloud, um, so this might be all the way back to like 2007, maybe even 2008. And uh, you can see here uh, on screen, this was the facility where we kept, you know, one copy of our content. We kept two copies, one copy on site at ICPSR and then one copy off site in a separate geographic location with some lonely operator keeping an eye on the content uh, out there. Um, so you could see from this map our geographic diversity. Uh, so there's our main location in Ann Arbor. Well, there's yeah, it's kind of hard to see our other location. Let me let me uh, drill in a little bit more. Now you can start to see a little bit more of our geographic diversity there in uh, in southeast Michigan. But I really have to drill down farther. And so you can see in the middle of the screen, uh, there's the main copy at ICPSR in Ann Arbor. And then on the other side of I-94, we had our second copy. Uh, so there must have been a good, you know, five miles of different uh, of geographic diversity between our two copies. And that was that was kind of the state of things uh, back in, say, 2007, maybe 2006. So um, at about that time, uh, ICPSR uh, made two changes. One is uh, Nancy McGovern uh, joined us as our uh, chief preservation officer. And so Nancy's been really focused on uh, policy and best practices. Uh, she does a lot of work in the community, a lot of speaking, uh, her digital preservation management training course. And the technology group that, that I lead uh, began, uh, took over responsibility for managing archival storage. So, you know, keeping the bits around, uh, implementing the policy. And so one of the first things we did is, look, you know, tape is, is nice, it's inexpensive, but we, we just don't have that much stuff. And so why don't we put it on disk instead of tape? And that'll make it much easier uh, to synchronize content to other locations, have many more than two copies. And uh, of course, if something's on disk, it makes it much easier to check fixity, look for things like bit rot, or, or more commonly, at least in, in our case, uh, find where somebody's made a mistake and something's become corrupted and it needs to be repaired. And so, um, once we move things to to disk, uh, we could make copies outside of you know Ann Arbor city limits uh, much more easily and manage them. And so on this diagram, you can see uh, you know we still have the uh, Ann Arbor copy, and then it's, it's tough to see in this view. But uh, the second copy in Michigan in this uh, view is at Michigan State, so that's you know, that's maybe a, a hundred miles away in, in East Lansing, Michigan. And then out on the West Coast, we also had some friends at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. And so we had a copy out there in their storage grid. And, you know, that gave us uh, three copies. And we thought we were doing pretty well then. Um, 
but in the end, these copies are, are stored with friends. So it's sort of based on personal relationships, uh, maybe between uh, me and somebody I know at the institution, uh, maybe a relationship between the uh, ICPSR director, um, which can change every five years or so, uh, and, uh, and another organization. And so there was really no service level agreement to set expectations about how reliable uh, things could be uh, or how unreliable uh, that we might expect. Uh, it was really hard to scale up and down because when you're asking your friends to kind of keep your bits for you, you know, it's difficult to tell them, hey, I need you to go out and buy another terabyte for me. Um, even if you have some way to, to pay them to do it, they might not have the time or uh, the ability to add that capacity. And of course, with different friends, you might have a different interface. Um, so when we were using the San Diego Supercomputing uh, Center's grid, uh, we used the SRB technology to do all of our storage. And with the copy at Michigan State, it was just on a file server, and we would use common file system type utilities to synchronize content. Uh, and then, you know, as we would add more friends, uh, you know, everything was always a little bit different. And, you know, with contracts, you know, there was just never really any kind of a, a contract. And certainly anybody that's uh, tried to get uh, a university uh, legal office to help out with a contract uh, would know that it, uh, it can be difficult and, and time consuming. Uh, so uh, as the cloud started to uh, emerge for us, at least uh, uh, at least for us back in 2008, 2009, uh, we started to use the cloud, Amazon's cloud in particular, for a replica of our um, of our web delivery system. Um, so as some of you who might use ICPSR uh, know, or maybe even visited uh, ICPSR, we're in a building that's just so slightly off of Michigan's campus. And so we are on uh, the same consumer uh, commercial uh, power grid as the rest of Ann Arbor. We're not on the university's grid. And uh, it's the case that uh, we sometimes lose power. Uh, especially in the winter when there can be ice storms or so, snowstorms uh, in, the, in the Midwest and in Michigan in particular. And, um, you know, often the building uh, can lose power maybe once a year, once every two years for a couple of days. And so uh, that's, that's not good if your business is delivering social science uh, research data uh, to higher ed. And so uh, we found that we could make a copy of all of our infrastructure. Oracle database servers, Apache web servers, a lot of web applications running under Tomcat. And we could move that all into uh, the cloud and maintain it and synchronize it there relatively inexpensively. And then when disaster strikes uh, in Ann Arbor, we can fail things over to the cloud. Uh, what we basically do is, is change where www.icpsr.umich.edu points to and it you know, points to the cloud uh, for a while. and People can perform most of what they need to do in the cloud. They can't give us new content, but they can search for content and download content and, and do most of what they would normally do. And then we started to look at the cloud as a possible location for an additional copy of our archival holdings. And so um, we, we did that next. And uh, again, <clears throat> at, the, at the price of storage in the cloud, it's not that expensive if all you have is six terabytes. Uh, but that, of course, raises some questions once you start putting stuff in the cloud. Um, there's sort of the are you crazy question that uh, comes up in, in more polite ways. And so um, when I look at what we have here at ICPSR, I see, what, I see the left column here. So uh, in the relatively recent past, uh, we, did, uh, we documented all of our security controls uh, for FISMA. And uh, without... Well, I don't know. With, with a medium level of effort, we were able to uh, assert and then document that we could meet the low level of FISMA you know, pretty easily uh, here. And, and so that's what we ended up doing. And that was sufficient uh, for the project that we needed to complete. Uh, in general, uh, the content that we have here at ICPSR, uh, it's not encrypted, even if it's something uh, somewhat sensitive. We wouldn't tend to keep it encrypted uh, here at the, at the main location. Uh, all of our content stored in a machine room, and you know it has somewhat open access, so members of my team can get into the room. Uh, the university, 
I've got a question here, but I'm going to get back to that in, in just a little bit. Um, uh, members of the university's uh, plant operations department, so the people that fix air conditioning units, uh, they all have access to it. Um, uh, you know, really anybody that might have a key or a master key to the lock that's on the room, because it has both a lock and a swipe card, uh, are able to get into that room. So it, it's a lot of people. Uh, we do have a firewall to help protect uh, the content that lives on a, on a big EMC storage array. And like I said, there's professional IT staff uh, who, who are on my team and others can get in there. Uh, but, you know, when we looked at Amazon's cloud, uh, the FISMA controls are actually advertised as the medium level. So that seems, uh, you know, that, that's better than I can document right now. And the one uh, change we did is for, for anything that could be sensitive. Uh, so anything that we knew to be sensitive, anything that was an original deposit that may or may not have uh, been reviewed yet, uh, we encrypt all of that with, uh, with strong encryption. Um, I'm... Uh, but, you know, uh, Amazon uh, documents um, that it has controlled access to its machine rooms. Uh, there's, again, there are firewalls because we make use of the uh, Amazon uh, security groups to control what protocols can move um, uh, into our little piece of as Amazon's cloud. And again, you have professional uh, IT space uh, or professional IT staff who are allowed to get in there. Uh, the question here, you know, how did you use Amazon's cloud service before moving the archival content there too? Uh, really, the use was for our, our delivery copies. So this is all uh, material that would be uh, public use. And the only distinction we really make at ICPSR is, is it data that come to us through a government contract or grant where access should be open to the public, or is it something that is uh, that we've curated using our membership monies? And so in that case, the content, because it was paid for with membership funds, is available only to ICPSR's membership, which is still, you know, six, seven hundred organizations across the world. Um, so, you know, we had a real kind of honeymoon period for Amazon over the past uh, year or two. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, it was easy to get signed up. Uh, Amazon only asks one question. Well, what's your credit card number? Uh, it's one that uh, any IT director can answer easily. Uh, by contrast, when we uh, were looking at Michigan's internal uh, uh, facilities to make uh, a copy, um, you know, you you had to go before some special committee to get their blessing to participate, and you had to give estimates on the amount of electricity you needed, measured in you know kilowatts, and uh, questions that weren't as easy for us to to answer as people who are typically managing software and uh, not managing, um, you know, not managing hardware or managing electrical systems. Um, and so, you know, what we ended up doing in, in Amazon for our archival copy, uh, we find the file system uh, utilities, file system semantics, uh, to be a very convenient way to, to manage content for us. Again, we have lots, lots and lots of small files. And so rather than using Amazon's S3 service, their simple storage service, uh, which is a little more abstract, uh, we have a very small uh, Elastic Computing Cloud instance, very inexpensive to run, especially if you have a, a reserved instance and you can pay a little bit of money up front. And uh, then we take uh, what they call an Elastic Block Storage Volume, which is capped at one terabyte, but we get a, we get a couple of them and basically raid them together because you know it, even though it's it's cloud it still has all the semantics of a disk drive and then we can scale what we need up and down uh, pretty easily and we can synchronize content or copy content into the cloud using very standard file system uh, utilities and semantics uh, and then the best of all you know if you start if you're using uh, you know either storage arrays or or clouds to store copies uh, you don't need this big off-site uh, dungeon uh, full of uh, full of tapes, and so this is what it looked like after we cleared out uh, all of the tapes and, and made sure we had all the, the content copied from the tapes. And in fact, this building doesn't uh, exist anymore. Um, it's actually been torn down uh, within the past few months, and a Costco is uh, is uh, being built there. And so instead of having a lot of uh, tapes. Uh, probably there'll be, you know, inexpensive uh, foods and wines uh, in this location. 
so what's what's not to like uh, about the cloud? Well, you know, one is um, it, it's uh, it's easy enough to make one copy in one cloud provider's uh, one location. So we happen to have our copy in Amazon's cloud, and the location they call it a region is in Northern Virginia. So you know, it's more on the east coast of the United States, and that's far enough away from Ann Arbor that you know that that's pretty good. But it turns out to be somewhat cumbersome and expensive to replicate all of our Amazon infrastructure across other regions, uh, Europe or even the West Coast of the United States. And of course, if we just keep using Amazon, um, the technology platform isn't very diverse. You know, it's all Amazon stuff. And so when Amazon has a bad day, and they do sometimes, um, things don't work. Uh, although I have to say, in general, it's, it's been very, very solid. Uh, but whenever Amazon does fail, uh, it gets a lot of airplay out in the blogosphere. Uh, the operational processes used across Amazon facilities are probably uh, similar. Um, and also, there's always the question, well, what if Amazon goes out of business and you, and you lose your copy? Well, you know, if, if we have six copies out there and we lose one, uh, and there's just no opportunity to copy it somewhere else, it's not the end of the world, we still have five copies. Um, and being locked into a, you know one vendor is always always a concern. And so the thought was, um, well, you know, we could make use of other cloud providers. I mean, they are out there like Rackspace and Microsoft and, and so on. Um, but then we have to learn a lot more about their idiosyncratic interfaces. Uh, so who can save us? Who can help us out so that to us we have the illusion of one provider? But maybe under the hood, there's actually two or three or four or more cloud providers. And uh, DuraCloud came to save us. It's a tale of redemption. So what, what we've liked so far about working with uh, DuraSpace and the DuraCloud platform uh, is that it is this single interface to the cloud or the cloud of clouds. Um, and so, you know, I can... I can use uh, an interface provided by uh, DuraSpace to make to, to synchronize some content into uh, the cloud. And uh, you know, if I turn the right knobs uh, under the hood, I can actually have copies show up in multiple clouds and get uh, multiple copies through one single action. Um, I have one single relationship, one single billing contact uh, to manage. Um, again, those of you who have uh, maybe university-based credit cards you know that if you're getting bills from all these different uh, uh, cloud companies each month, uh, the administrative burden uh, for, for you to, at least the way it works here, and we have a system called Concur, um, and to sort of fill out a different expense report for each one of these things and go back and forth about, is it a membership or is it a computing supply or is it you know, this thing or that thing, uh, is, is actually pretty high. And so it can save a considerable amount of time uh, just to have one relationship and even one billing contact. Uh, and the other thing we've liked about uh, uh, the DuraCloud offering is some of the value-added services. So since we have these small files and they tend to be text-based or, or whether they're numbers or words, you know, we don't use uh, too many of the video type or the delivery type of, of services that, uh, that DuraCloud has. Uh, but we do make use of, of services like the fixity checking and replicating into other clouds. Uh, and then just to, you know, I, always with the, uh, with, with the uh, good, there's, uh, you know, just a, a few small things that, that I would change if, uh, if I was a, a king for a day. Um, because right now our, our archival storage container is just a simple file system, um, file system semantics would work uh, better for us in, in some ways. And so the, the poster child here for us is, you know, if we're, if we're synchronizing content between place A and place B, uh, being able to use something like rsync, um, you know, very standard uh, Unix utility works really well. Uh, with uh, DuraCloud, I'm using something called Sync Tool. Uh, it's a Java-based uh, app. And so, you know, when... Uh, when my guys have to patch a machine and reboot my desktop computer, uh, you know, I've got to get, I got to remember to start up the sync tool again. Whereas something like rsync, I could run it out of a cron job on a server and, and kind of forget about it and have somebody keep an eye on the, uh, on the output. And again, uh, files versus objects, again, those, those sort of semantics uh, work pretty well for us.
Um, support for arbitrarily big files would be nice. Some of our content uh, turns out not to be small files, but uh, maybe a big tape image. And at some point, we should really get into that tape image and bust it apart and look at what's in there and, and give it some care and feeding. Uh, but in the short term, I might have a, a, a 20 gig uh, tape image. And so it's one big file. And um, while DuraCloud can split that across, can split that up into little tiny files, ideally I could just you know put it out there and keep it in one piece. Uh, and then again, lastly, uh, having some tools that would make um, uh, that would more, are sort more, more suitable for batch use out of uh, you know things like cron um, automation um, is very big with us. And so those were some of the things um, I'm always uh, talking to, to Michelle and Carissa about. So uh, maybe the, the takeaways uh, for my part of the talk is uh, certainly in, in our experience, uh, the cloud's a viable option for making additional archival copies. I might not put my one and only copy in somebody's cloud, uh, but uh, certainly I would put one of my end copies uh, in a cloud. Uh, the, the control and management of the physical infrastructure uh, from a cloud provider it, it might be at least as good as what you can do yourself. Uh, certainly in our case, um, there's nothing that I can do with the physical layer that's as good as what the Amazon guys can do. Um, I think encrypting anything that might be insensitive or maybe just you know encrypting everything, um, as long as you know where the keys are and can get to those uh, is a good strategy because then even if somebody does get a hold of your stuff somehow, um, it's not, uh, it's not, um, you have some protection. Uh, and I would say, though, that the cloud isn't necessarily the low-cost solution. I mean, with the cloud, you know, you're paying for not only, you know, the systems administrators and the storage and the computers, you're paying for the air conditioning and the electricity. And so in your own machine room, it might be the case that some of those costs are hidden. Certainly a lot of those costs are hidden to me. In my machine room, I never see the electric bill. Some other part of the university uh, sees that and pays it for me. And so it gives me the illusion that I get free cooling, free heating, free uh, electrical service. Um, but the cloud has been the low hassle solution for us. So in terms of provisioning a solution, scaling it up, tearing it down, growing it, shrinking it, it's, it's, it's very good. Um, the, the Amazon experience, um, either directly using it directly or using it through uh, DuraCloud has been very good. Uh, and then I'll just uh, wrap up. This is my final slide uh, with just a little bit of uh, contact information. If you have any uh, you know, questions, uh, you know, feel free to drop me a note at uh, brian at umich.edu. There's also a, a, a tech at ICPSR blog that I try to post to a couple of times a week uh, that tends to focus on uh, you know, what we're doing with things like track uh, requirements, uh, what we're doing with the cloud, uh, new software, and things that are going on at ICPSR. So I think uh, I think with that I'll uh, I'll conclude and let uh, Carissa grab the controls away. Or wait a minute, I think I'm supposed to advance yeah, to the next slide. Yeah, advance to the next slide. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Brian. There you go. So we wanted to let you know about a few additional upcoming webinars. If you have a further interest in DuraCloud, we will be giving a technical overview of the architecture on November 16th. And this would appeal to uh, developers and also um, architects who want to know a little bit more about the underpinnings of DuraCloud and also how to participate in the open source uh, deployment and development. Uh, November 30th, we have the DSpace DSpace integration with DuraCloud. So DSpace 1.8 uh, has a nice clean integration with DuraCloud. So you can actually run controls. Uh, you can actually control DuraCloud through your DSpace uh, ad administrative interface. So we'll give you a, a briefing on that and how that works. And then January 11th is the Fedora integration with DuraCloud. Fedora has a utility called CloudSync which allows you to easily move content between your Fedora instance and into DuraCloud, um, which has an automated uh, handling and, and, and processing associated with it. Uh, we did launch DuraCloud as a service actually yesterday. We, over the last <laughs> two years, we've been in pilot and the last six months, we've been in our beta program with our 
partners who have been uh, using using DuraCloud as actual customers, uh, ICPSR and Brian being one of them out of uh, about 10 total. We have now opened it up to anybody that would like to uh, subscribe. Um, before subscribing, you can try it out by signing up for a, a trial account. And you can do that by hitting the try it button or hitting the, you know, get your first month free uh, button that you'll find on the website. Next slide. And we do have a website, DuraCloud.org. Chris Smith is our partner specialist and is there to answer, answer any questions you might have about DuraCloud, technical or otherwise. Uh, and you can link off to our wiki um, from the DuraCloud.org site, which has a lot of documentation and um, other information that may be of interest. So I think that is the last slide. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions for either uh, Brian or I. As a note, everybody is now unmuted, so feel free to voice your questions or uh, submit them via the chat. Should we ask a question? This is an ALA. Uh, I know we're through ALA. Can you speak up? All the way uh, down. No. no. Down to where the right next to the 43. Is. Yeah. Just yeah. crap. Chatting. Yeah. Yeah. That's a question. Uh, cost? Yeah. Hey, hey, um, yes, it's fun. Um, <laughs> but it's right next to Wait. Okay, so it looks like there's a question on the chat. If we sign up for a trial, will we pay for the service provider? Uh, for example, Amazon. No, if you sign up for a trial, you it's a free free one month. You don't pay anything. Uh, you get access to all the services in DuraCloud, and you can put up to uh, 200 or 500 gig of uh, storage. Uh, use up to 200 or 500 gig. 200. I forget, Carissa, correct me. Is it 500 gigabyte Five, storage? 500 gigabyte of storage. Yeah, mm -hmm. during yeah. that um, trial period. Uh, some different formats. Some data, some uh, moving image, some audio, text, text will be, text will be. yeah. And, and um, we're supposed to get exactly what we put in out, so. Okay, so we have a few questions coming through the chat. Um, Floyd asks questions about cost. Do we pay for each of the multiple clouds plus the cost of your service? Straightforward as you would say. Okay. Um, do sorry, Carissa, can you repeat the question? Yes, I can. Um, do the customers pay for each of the multiple clouds plus the cost of our service? Okay, so there is a subscriber fee for the service, that's for DuraSpace managing the service, administering um, the technology and actually aggregating all the, the costs across the cloud providers. So in that subscriber service, uh, that includes 500 gigabytes of storage um, at your primary storage provider. If you go over 500 gigabytes, then you would pay for that additional storage um, regardless if it's at Amazon or Rackspace or whatever provider you choose, and that is at the the rack, you know, basically the published rate of the storage provider, which today is running um, about a dollar per gigabyte per year, um, or you know, eight cents per gigabyte per month. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. No, it just says they use multiple ones, but that doesn't mean it's that. Okay, we have more costs coming, more questions coming in. Um, the next one is if you could please clarify or repeat the current and anticipated cloud providers that DuraCloud is integrated with. Sure. So today, DuraCloud is integrated with Amazon and Rackspace. On the roadmap for January is uh, Microsoft Azure. And also in that time frame, somewhere between January and March is San Diego Supercomputer. Um, we are in beta testing right now with San Diego Supercomputer and Microsoft Azure. And so we hope to get them on as cloud provider three and four um, right after the new year, 2012. 
Okay, the next question that was submitted via the chat um, is how DuraCloud handles large files. Is there a file size limit? Yeah, that's a good question. So there, the ability to transfer files over the wire, over the internet, because you are basically uploading files via HTTPS is pretty much pro, uh, pragmatically limited to about one or two gigabytes. That's what we find. Files over two gigabytes typically uh, time out and don't make it to their destination. So, however, the cloud providers, and, and they vary by cloud provider what, what they'll accept, but for example, Amazon, you can deposit up to a five terabyte file. Um, Rackspace, uh, is similar, although I think it's a little bit smaller. Uh, however, unless you deliver it on disk, it's very hard to get over the wire um, at that size. So what we land up doing for files larger than one or two gigabyte, we basically chunk those files up um, through a tool. It's, it's our, you know, a chunking tool, which is part of our, our what, what Brian referred to as the sync tool. And then uh, we now actually stitch that file back together once it lands. Um, well, once you, if you want to stream it out of the cloud, we stitch, we stitch the file back together. So when you send it over, it gets chunked up. When you stream it out, it gets stitched back together. Um, and that's at least at this point in time, how we've been handling the larger files. So the next question in a perfect segue from the chat is, is the internet the only way to transport content to storage or is there an option for sending physical media? Uh, yeah, you can send physical media. Um, it is, it, it has been done. It, you can basically copy it to disk with a manifest and we can import it for you in one of the cloud providers. Um, it is not ideal though, because it's a fairly long cycle time uh, to get that content loaded into one of the cloud providers. And it's certainly, um, it's a lot of work and effort on your side to download it properly and create the manifests. And if you're loading more than a couple terabytes of data, um, you know, there's the cost of provisioning those hard drives to cycle stuff back and forth, but it, it can be done. The next question from the chat is, does it cost to access content in DuraCloud? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, so it doesn't cost to access content in DuraCloud, but if you are going to, um, so access mean, mean view, view it and, and what have you, but if you're going to download content, there is a cost to download content, um, which is basically the, the transfer out cost, which um, is 10 cents per gigabyte uh, per the cloud providers. There is no cost to transfer in content, though, to the cloud providers because they, they have actually gotten rid of, eliminated that cost. Yeah. I don't want you to think. Okay, the next question from the chat. Do you see a possibility to integrate DuraCloud with private cloud middleware, such as OpenStack? So OpenStack is a... Um, you know, is deployed on Rackspace, for example. It's also deployed on San Diego Supercomputer. It's, uh, so we actually integrate at the storage layer so that DuraCloud actually sits on top of an open stack layer. Um, and that would be the, the adapter that we would use, the open stack adapter to then talk to DuraCloud, which sits on top. So if you have an open stack implementation in your facility, you should be able to run DuraCloud on top of that. Okay, we have a few more questions coming in via chat. The next is, how deep is the troubleshooting with the cloud providers? Would we, a customer, ever need to deal with them instead of DuraCloud? Okay, uh, so I'm not sure. So we deal directly with cloud providers. So if there's a problem like your instance goes down or something goes offline, we are there to restart it for you and make sure all systems are going running. Uh, so in that sense, we are a technical support layer in between the cloud providers and you. And certainly if there's any issue with the door cloud platform, we're fully in charge of, of that. Um, I, you know, the, if, if something happens at one of the cloud providers, like let's say 
they go offline and there's nothing we can do about it, um, then we would just be the communication channel and be working with them to understand what's going on. So I don't, I mean, there, maybe there would be a situation where you would want to deal directly with them, but the way we've envisioned this is that, um, you know, we would be there as the, uh, the mediator <laughs> with the providers that were being used. Okay, the next question from the chat is, do we choose our cloud providers or is that all controlled by DuraCloud? Yeah, that's a good question. So right now we have DuraCloud, the service running on Amazon as, Amazon as the primary cloud provider. Um, and you can choose to put your stuff in, uh, well, typically the primary cloud provider. And that choice is somewhat made for you. Um, if you want to put a secondary copy of your stuff into Rackspace, you make that choice. When we have a broader network, um, and even today, you could choose to put your primary copy in in Rackspace instead of Amazon. So you have that choice, uh, but there would be some extra costs associated with that because of running the compute in Amazon. So in terms, in terms of storage, you have complete choice where to put your stuff, but in terms of where your DuraCloud application runs, right now it runs at Amazon. Okay, the next question on the chat, and they just keep coming in, so thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Is DuraCloud just about storage and preservation slash disaster recovery, or does DuraCloud also take place take the place of an on-site server? So, in other words, Floyd asks, I still need a local environment, such as a server or a digital asset management system, and some local storage to function. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yes. So today, DuraCloud is primarily Primary, the primary use case today for DuraCloud is online digital archiving and preservation support. However, that being said, DuraCloud is a platform and there, our plan is to deploy multiple applications and one of them or several of them being a front end application you could choose from. So what are some front end, front end applications we've been talking about on the roadmap? DSpace is one of them. So you could basically launch DSpace in the cloud with DuraCloud in the cloud as well. Um, Drupal has been another that we've talked about as a front end system. Uh, so they're all possible, but given that we've just launched uh, the service yesterday, um, I, I can't say definitively which ones will be the first uh, that, we'll, that we will deploy. So they're on the roadmap, but that's, that's the status of today. Yeah, and that gives you a chance to Okay, the next question, how well does DuraCloud work with audio or video files? So you can upload audio or video files into DuraCloud. Um, you okay. can play those files via the media streamer, which is embedded in DuraCloud. There is a restriction on what types of formats the media streamer will handle. I believe MPEG-4, MPEG-3 are the standards and um, but we have a list of what files it supports um, on the site. The only issue with video files, as I mentioned before, is you know if the video files are bigger than a couple gigs, they have to be chunked up to put in the cloud, um, which and some people don't don't like that. The next question from the list is: Will we receive an email regarding how to attend the DSpace or cloud integration presentation? And I can answer that, Michelle. Give you a break. Thanks. Certainly, we'll be sending out uh, the registration link as soon as it's available, um, and we'll be sending it out to all of the attendees to today's webinar. So the next question, um, do you have a sample service level agreement, um, the terms, available for viewing? Yes, those are available on the site, and you can download them. Um, Carissa, you might tell them the exact link because I can't remember off the top of my head. Yep. If you go to duracloud.org slash subscribe and choose any uh, of the plans that you're interested, uh, we have slightly different terms and conditions depending on the plan. Uh, you can certainly uh, find them through that link. And it's a downloadable PDF. That's correct. Um, the next question, are you planning to offer a service where cloud storage um, is available outside of the U.S.? So out of the U.S. government jurisdiction. Yes. So our all of our cloud providers, well, not all of them, but many of them have Europe and Asia as additional um, storage centers. And so we plan on having DuraCloud available in those regions as well with the network of cloud providers that have storage in those regions. 
All right, we still have a few more questions to get through. Um, Tyra asked, would we, be, would we be responsible for undertaking migrations? Well, so you are always responsible because you own the content. So we, we only put um, preservation support tools and we enable automation of those support tools through the, the Dura Cloud service. But we don't take your content and say, we'll preserve it for life. We're not a preservation service in that sense. It's a preservation cloud enabled platform. So uh, what we don't have in the in Dura Cloud today, but it's something that many of our users have asked is we don't have a, mi a migration tool or migration service tool built into the, the Dura Cloud applications. Um, when that is available, then migrations will be possible. Um, that's on the roadmap, but it's on the, the more long-term roadmap um, at this date. We do have a uh, transformation service. So if you know you want to convert images from TIFFs to, J to JPEGs, that um, is on the roadmap, the short-term roadmap for DuraCloud. Uh, but we do hope to add some migration tools as well. Question from Kevin on the chat. Does a portion of the fees go to supporting DSpace? So a portion of the fees goes to supporting the DuraSpace organization, and that is a portion of the subscription fee. And that uh, fee supports DuraSpace, which supports DSpace and Fedora, uh, as well as the operational costs associated with us running um, DuraCloud in the cloud um, as well. Okay, the next question, can we direct users to the content stored on DuraCloud? Yes, so the content that's stored on DuraCloud is uh, accessible via a URL and you can make that URL open. And if you make it open, then you can share that with anybody you like, either through emailing it or embedding it into a website or a blog post or whatever you like. Two more questions on the chat. Joe asks that Brian mentioned the track certification and he wants to know how DuraCloud may or may not fit in with track certification. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so there are several, several, um, so track certification, certification is really based on uh, your organization having a preservation strategy and policies in place and the staff to administer that. It's really organizationally based. Um, however, if DuraCloud is part of your strategy, it might allow you to check some of the boxes for your track certification, such as multiple copies of content and multiple geographies. Um, and we have started to develop a list of what DuraCloud enables in terms of your track certification process. Okay, and then the last question that I've seen come through on the chat is what is the legal venue for the service agreement? So for example, state of California or New York or some other state. Can you repeat that? Sorry, I didn't really hear that one, yep. the legal. The legal venue for our service agreements. So for example, the state of California or New York or some other state. So our standard service level agreement is the state of um, New York but we've been somewhat flexible based on uh, you know, who, the, who the, the university is that we're talking with. Start to cross our images. Okay, there's been a few more questions coming through as I just mentioned that was the last. So Floyd asks, uh, user access doesn't function as a database, does it? I mean, you would need Drupal or something in between. Is that correct? That's correct. Use, there's, there is a, um, well, that's correct and not correct. So, there is a what we call a management console where you can establish the users that would have direct access to DuraCloud, DuraCloud being almost like an administrative portal for viewing content and deciding what services to run on that content. So you can set up multiple users through your uh, management console, some permissions associated with those users. If you want to give general access to the content stored. Like for example, you have a video and you wanna allow a bunch of researchers to see that video. Then you have to embed that video link in a front end application. You wouldn't necessarily send them directly to the DuraCloud Management Console. You would just basically expose the link to that video um, in some other interface or you know, even an email for that matter. 
Thanks. Okay. And another question that just came through the chat as well from Brian. He wants to know how does authorization work and if it works with Shibboleth. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, authorization right now, uh, you set, I mean, there, in, in terms of if your university is using Shibboleth or some other authorization system, you would provide, if you're giving access to content in DuraCloud, you would then come through the front end application where you've already have authorization in place. So for example, if you have, if you have DSpace and you have authorization via Shibboleth, then that, uh, that authorization protocol would persist down to your DuraCloud layer. However, that being said, we do have um, right now Shibboleth as a direct authorization implementation on the roadmap with DuraCloud. And, um, oh. and that's because we've been talking with Internet2 as potentially offering this as a service through Internet2, and that's one of the requirements. So that is on the roadmap. <laughs> That is it of the questions that have come through the chat, unless anybody else has something that they'd like me to voice to Michelle. Or Brian. <laughs> or Brian, yes, poor Brian. Probably that slacker. Okay, well, thanks uh, everyone for attending, and it really just a great set of questions. Um, I, I really appreciate everybody's questions and um, interest in DuraCloud. It really helps us in figuring out where to take uh, the project and the, the service. Um, my email is mkimpton at duraspace.org and I'm happy to receive any additional questions directly. Uh, and then also you have Chris Smith's email and you've gotten Brian's email as well. We will be posting this webinar on the duracloud.org website. So if you want to refer back to it or if you want to refer um, your colleagues to it, please feel free to do so. And it will be under the learn more tab of the duracloud.org website. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much. And everybody have a good day.